Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing in our study of this book by Josh McDowell, More Than a Carpenter. This is part four. If you have not seen the previous uh, studies, uh, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning uh, already. And just uh, uh, we've only gone through two chapters in the book in, in about six hours discussing it. And I think already a lot of uh, very important things were uh, uh, discussed. And so um, before we get started, though, let me ask uh, why I have Brother uh, Ted uh, on the telephone. Uh, He'll be listening along, and sometimes he might decide to speak speak up. And if he does, uh, uh, this is Ted, and his YouTube channel is God's Truth Ministries. So I hope you will subscribe to his channel. Also, please subscribe to Brother Bill and Brother Joe's. Wait, well, don't subscribe to Joe's channel, though. He says he's already got more than enough subscribers. He doesn't really want to be bothered with you, right, Joe? <laughs> Joe, you go first. Well, that's that's not that's not exactly true. I I uh, I, I like the intimacy of having uh, uh, fewer numbers, but uh, there's still a lot of people that I that I really like out there that I would love to have sub my channel. Uh, but uh, you know, I just I don't like uh, just getting a whole bunch of people that never interact with me and you know never comment back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I like this is this is not so much a teaching. Uh, channel for me. This is a fellowship channel, so uh, I'd love to have a thousand subs uh, if they all, you know, communicated with me and didn't throw stones at me. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of people out there that I still don't have sub to me that I would love to have sub to me. And if you're watching this video, then uh, you're probably one of them. So uh, I, I I do encourage you to come to my channel and, and sub, and I'll sub you right back. Uh, and the channel is Sebastian Dresden Channel, and uh, looking forward to today's talk. Back to you, Luke. Uh, so uh, I didn't represent Brother Joe exactly right then. He, he does want you to subscribe, provided that you're uh, someone that wants to interact. Don't just be some meaningless subscriber that never never does anything, I guess. But uh, uh, Brother, Brother Joe is... is uh, He's, he's a great asset to this uh, this group discussion uh, and, and also he is um, gifted in, in he, he's able to kind of synthesize um, something that takes me maybe several minutes to explain he synthesizes it down to one or two words very very well uh, he's the one that coined the term and identified me as a um, King James firstist and he also coined the term when I was uh, trying to explain to people about the, the rightly dividing the Word of God and what I thought of that concept. He, he says, well, what you're really saying is what you're doing is saying we should rightly unite the Word of God. So rightly uniting, uh, that means making it all the Bible uh, coherent together to make sense as a, as a unit. Uh, so uh, that's Brother Joe has this great uh, great ability to do that. So, um, what would you say, Brother Joe? Uh, uh, I just explained this uh, unique talent you have. Maybe you can synthesize that down. How, what what is that talent called? Uh, I ain't as stupid as I look. Now, now you said that about me, and I'm going to ramble and babble like an idiot all show. You do know that. So you set yourself up for that, and uh, and I do apologize in advance. All right. Yeah, I did kind of put you under the pressure there, bragging about this great talent, and then put you on the spot to come up with a clever one, you know, one or two word uh, phrase. <laughs> uh, we also have Brother Bill joining us. Please subscribe to his uh, YouTube channel. He's got uh, several, but I'll let him tell you about that. Brother Bill. Yep. Yeah, cheers. Cheers for that, and and also. You know, being uh, Brother Joe's being fussy, you know, all the ones that were going to pointlessly subscribe him, <laughs> come to my channel instead. <laughs> only joke, only joking. No, but my channel is uh, Bill Cuff, but Iron Panda, and uh, that's my main channel that I do just about everything on. But I've also got another channel, uh, Hope Harolded, 
uh, I'll put a comment on this, you know, this 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 video in the thread later on, uh, and that one is just purely for street evangelism, nothing else. So if street evangelism encourages you, or, or anything like that, subscribe there. And for anything else, just subscribe me to, you know, Bill Cuthbert, the Iron Panda. Thanks, Luke. Well, yeah, please uh, subscribe to Brother Bill's channels, and uh, uh, be besides the teaching uh, that he's doing on YouTube, the street preaching that he does is um, it's it's probably the only example of street preaching that I, I could actually endorse. Uh, he he, say, he he goes out with the, the the right spirit as an ambassador. To Christ, drawing people to Christ with a, a, a loving demeanor and, and, the, and the, the message that it's a love story he's sharing, and his his uh, the gospel message he's he's preaching is unique among street preachers in that it's actually the true gospel. <laughs> you don't get that from other street preachers. All right, so let's begin. Uh, we're uh, on the, the book More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. We're beginning. Uh, chapter 3 today. And chapter 3, the title is, What About Science? And let me preface this before we get started, saying that uh, a lot of the information in this chapter, uh, I've, I've put it on some of my videos uh, that are, are on my playlist, uh, Science, God, and, and the Bible. <clears throat> and uh, I also had on that playlist in addition to some videos I've made, I probably have more than a hundred uh, videos from other people, and many of them are some of the most renowned, uh, most esteemed uh, scientists in the world, and, and it's showing that that um, the Bible is scientific. It is scientifically correct, and if you're not aware of that and you you want it proven to you, we're going to begin to prove it today with a study, but. This, what we're going to discuss in this chapter here, is just a, a you know, minuscule scratching the surface on this, this topic. So let me begin reading, and then I'll ask each one of you to uh, give your thoughts on it. <clears throat> it says, um, many people try to put off personal commitment to Christ by voicing the assumption that if you cannot prove something scientifically, it is not true or worthy of acceptance. Since one cannot prove scientifically the deity of Jesus or the resurrection, then 20th century individuals should know better than to accept Christ as Savior or to believe in the resurrection. Now, of course, that's not Josh McDowell's sentiment. He's, he's saying that that's how many people today are their, at, their attitude. Often, in a philosophy or history class, I am confronted with the challenge, quote, can you prove it scientifically? I usually say, well, no, I'm, I'm not a scientist, unquote. Then you can hear the class chuckle, uh, and usually several voices can be heard saying, don't talk to me about it, or see, you must, you must take it all by faith, meaning blind faith. All right, let me stop here and get, get your thoughts on that. Uh, I'll start with Brother Bill today first. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and it is actually quite commonplace and a very sad, you know, you know sentiment that, that people think like that. And they always seem to use it when, again, I think we've made this point loads of times, when Jesus Christ is mentioned, you know, comes the, the ridicule and, and stuff. But, you know, if you said to the same person, you know, if you offered over another example and say, well, prove scientifically that, that, you know, Julius Caesar existed. Well, that, you know, that you're trying to prove something historical with science. So, you know, it's just, it was a pain. But, you know, I do believe, obviously, as we're going to go through this, there are a lot of scientists and there's a lot of scientific proof, or, you know, of, you know, a creator or a creator God. But, yeah, you know, I understand the sentiment. That, that you know is, is out there because I get it quite a lot myself. All right, brother Joe, your thoughts, please. Yeah, you know, I like to I like to tell uh, non-believers and atheists 
uh, you know, if you come across a really closed-minded Christian who uh, uses the Bible to prove there is a God, you can simply look at that closed-minded Christian and tell them that uh, they can't prove it, and therefore there can't be a God, because you can't prove there's a God, so that proves there's not a God. It's really stupid. It's kind of silly. And they're using the thing they blame you of uh, to, to uh, prove their point. And what they don't realize is that the Bible is one of the most historically accurate and, and uh, historically provable documents uh, in the world. I mean, it is the most historically pro I mean, more than the Iliad. Uh, as far as ancient documents go. And uh, so uh, they try to disprove God by disproving you without ever looking at the evidence of the Bible. And it's all so silly. And, uh, you know, if they if they give it some thought, they, they'd feel silly. So I think I might open a channel and just be a pretend atheist and, and use their arguments uh, with them, and, and maybe they'll see in the mirror how stupid they are. I'm not them the arguments. They're all quite intelligent, but uh, uh, ignorant. Back to you. Hmm. Uh, well, I, I mentioned already this playlist I have on my channel called Science, God, and the Bible. And it's, it's very comprehensive. It's just packed with uh, um, videos by some great scientists and then just some people like me and us that we don't claim to be scientists but we do the best we can to uh, discuss this uh, science in the Bible but I've over the years um, I've developed an attitude about uh, evangelism and what we call witnessing uh, giving our testimony about uh, our faith in Jesus Christ and, and the Bible does tell us to always be ready with an answer uh, for the faith that we have. We should be able to defend our faith and, instead of just uh, someone saying, well, there's nothing backing up what you believe. It's just blind faith. And, and there, there is um, a ton of historical support, archaeological support, uh, fulfilled prophecies, scientific truths that support the Bible. And, and, and so we do have this uh, uh, as, as evidence to support our beliefs, but uh, uh, I oftentimes when I'm talking to someone, I usually just only do this, not in the hangout. The, the, these hangouts are not for arguing with people over these things, but, but many times in an individual private interaction with someone, uh, I, I've gotten into these uh, conversations and I don't try to uh, explain to them just extemporaneously as I am right now, I explain to them and prove to them. What I do is I say, look, I've spent many, many hours um, uh, preparing uh, an answer for you. I put it um, in the form of a video. In fact, I have a playlist that is, goes into great detail that I believe is very convincing. So my question to you, Mr. Atheist, uh, Mr. Evolutionist, or whatever your particular uh, belief is that's contrary to Bible and the creation account, for example, uh, if you uh, have a sincere desire to get the answers rather than just wanting to, you know, argue, um, if you really have that the right attitude and desire, would you really want to consider our, our side of this? then I'll, I'll provide it to you. Here's a link to my playlist. Most of the times, they just ignore it because their purpose is not to try to learn something and consider another another viewpoint. Their purpose is just to argue and stir up trouble. But on a, a few occasions over eight years now on YouTube, I have had some people that sincerely wanted to consider our perspective. And I, I can happily tell you that there have been a couple of atheists over the years that have been won over for Christ and the Bible because they, they had the attitude that, okay, uh, I'll try to be objective. I want to hear the other side of the argument. And they, they look at these videos, they look at my playlist, and they realize that 
we're, we're not arg arguing from blind faith. We have a lot of things that support our, our, our beliefs. Uh, before I read any further, let me get your thoughts on that uh, first, Bill. Uh, my only thoughts would be is to encourage people to, to, to look at that playlist you've got. You know, I don't even think of notice that playlist, so I might even go there myself. But yeah, you know, I agree. There is science out there that, that proves, you know, God and proves the biblical account. And, and you know, if people are, are earnest enough and they want to seek out these things, you know, they will be found. You know. All right, brother Joe. Any thoughts before I move on? Yeah, uh, real quick. You want to open a separate uh, a separate account? Just call it Luke's Library. And uh, and have one for your current teachings or uh, uh, ministry stuff that you're doing, and have a have a separate account just for Luke's library, and break it into a, a easy to find thing. Uh, you've got a lot of videos on there. I mean, I haven't even scratched the surface of your videos, and I, for the past five years, have gone there quite frequently when I have questions on one thing or another. Uh, I will post what I promised I'd post last time. And that's the two hour and 30 minute uh, Josh McDowell uh, video uh, uh, evidence, uh, reasons for evidence. I forget what the name of it is, but it's a, a really, really good resource uh, for understanding the historicity of the Bible and uh, its, its uh, uh, reliability and compares it with, uh, with other uh, documents even, you know, 100 years ago. It it's, stands alone. So the, the evidence is out there. Uh, we just have to, you know, this is what this, sh this little th talk and get together is about. And it's what a lot of Christian activity on YouTube is about, is trying to get people to soften their hearts and open their minds enough to at least investigate the possibility that uh, there is a God and, and furthermore that he is Jesus Christ. Uh, that's done... Uh, more through uh, personal persuasion than scientific reasoning. You know, there's the thing of the the thing of the heart. You know, everybody has the ability to touch a few. You know, and maybe just one. But everybody had has somebody or some group of people that they can encourage to look into uh, the gospel that nobody else can. And so maybe you remind them of their dad that they loved, or maybe you say things in just a certain way that clicks with them. And that's what evangelism is all about. You know, it's not about going out and convincing people. It's about uh, trying to open people's heart uh, for the Holy Spirit to do his work. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. Okay, and... Uh I mentioned this in the very first episode uh, of this study that there's many other books that are uh, go into great detail, and that, that's this is the book that you are referencing there. Uh, it's another book by Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, 380 pages, and he has a follow-up to this one, and it's titled More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And these books are uh, really kind of like uh, advanced level college course compared to just something for a this one here is is more on a uh, elementary level. Uh, so this is kind of a reader's digest version of these larger books. So uh, the the video that you're going to post is I guess uh, uh, video of summary of this book here. Uh, all right, let me read a little further. Then it says uh, recently on a flight to Boston, I was talking with the passenger next to me about why I personally believe Christ is who he claimed to be. The pilot, making his public relations rounds, greeting the passengers, overheard part of our conversation. Quote, uh, you have a problem, unquote, he said. Uh, what is that? I, I asked. Uh, you can't prove it scientifically, he replied. Uh, the mentality that modern humanity has descended uh, to is amazing. Somehow, here in the 20th century, now, now we're in the 21st, of course, um, here in the 20th century, we have so many who hold to the opinion that if you can't prove it scientifically, it's not true. Well, that is not true. 
there's a problem of proving anything about a person or event in history. We need to understand the difference between scientific proof and what I call legal historical proof. Uh, let me explain uh, these two. Uh, scientific proof is based on showing that something is a fact by repeating the event in the presence of the person questioning the fact. There is a controlled environment where observations can be made, data drawn, and hypotheses uh, empirically verified. The scientific method, however, it is defined, is related to measurement of phenomena and experimentation or repeated observation. That's unquote, and that's by Dr. James B. Conant, former president of Harvard. He writes, quote, science is an interconnected series of concepts and conceptual schemes that have developed as a result of experimentation and observation and are fruitful of further experimentation and observations, unquote. Um, well, I better read a little further before I get your, your thoughts on this. Now, it says, t testing the truth of a hypothesis by the use of controlled experiments is one of the key techniques of the modern scientific method. For example, somebody says, quote, ivory soap doesn't float, unquote. So I take the person to the kitchen put eight inches of water in a sink at 82.7 degrees and drop in the soap. Plunk! Observations are made, data are drawn, and a hypothesis is empirically verified. Ivory soap floats. Now, if the scientific method was the only method of proving something, you couldn't prove that you went to your first hour class this morning or that you had lunch today. There's no way you can repeat those events in a controlled situation. Of course, there's a lot more he's going to say about laying the foundation for this argument, but let me pause for your, your thoughts. Bill? Well, yeah, because you can't obviously redo past. Unless, of course, the Mandela effect is involved, but that's only joking. But, you know, you can't redo the past, can you? As the experiment, like the creation, you, you, you can't do that. It has to be of the now and, and, and you know, in future tenses. I assume. So I'm not a scientist, you know, a scientist by, by a long shot, but yeah, you can't, you can't, as you just rightly said, you can't through science prove that I had lunch at, you know, three o'clock this afternoon because it's already happened, it's done and dusted, so there's no way of testing that, you know, that exact fact science, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, Brother Joe? Yeah, uh, First thing that comes to my mind is uh, the evangel evangelism point uh, in the airplane. When you were talking about that, I'm reminded of a Billy Graham story, which I really enjoy. Uh, he was in there, and uh, somebody, and this is off topic, and he, he was in there, and some drunk was pestering the stewardess, and everyone in the whole plane was getting quite upset. And uh, so someone nudged him and, and said, you know, it's the preacher Billy Graham sitting right next to me watching all of this. And so the guy, the drunk, stopped and he sobered up a little bit and walked over to Billy Graham and shook his hand. He says, uh, Preacher, you don't know what a big difference you've made in my life. <laughs> and Billy Graham said, I imagine that's true of many, many people like you. But uh, we all touch people. Um, as far as the point, you know, they're, they're talking about repeatable evidence, clinically repeatable evidences in the future of what's happened in the past. Like Bill said, pretty difficult. Uh, I would submit that billions have changed lives in the past and, uh, and the hopefully many, many more that will change every day that they could witness. Uh, now, I know that's not something you can put in a test tube, but uh, people's lives do change, and in a significant way, more so than just accepting a new fact that they didn't know for, know about, uh, they, the lives change in, in a way of love and relationship and, and uh, very evident or evidenced ways. And so I would point out 
to uh, uh, the the cynic that look at how many people have laid down their lives in love, not for revenge or some whacked out cult like uh, uh, sacrifice, but in love laid their lives down for the truth of the gospel, and uh, that's a lot of evidence there. Back to you, no. or I'm um, sorry, sir. Mm hmm Yes. Well, uh, the, 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 the book is going to explain this point uh, far better than, than I could uh, right now, but the, the, the point I think that we're going to uh, learn is that most things that people accept as truth cannot be proven scientifically. Uh, the idea that it's already been pointed to, that, you know, that you attended your class this morning, that you even showed up to work on time, uh, that, uh, that you, uh, you uh, had lunch today or something. M most, of, most of the things that we accept, well, that's true, and we, without any, any questioning the, the, the veracity of it, uh, we accept it, but it couldn't be proven scientifically. So let's continue reading here. Uh, now, if the scientific method was the only method of proving something. You couldn't prove that you went to your first hour class this morning or that you had lunch today. There's no way you can repeat those events in a controlled situation. Now, here's what is called the legal historical proof, which is based on showing that something is fact beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, a verdict is reached on the basis of the weight of the evidence. That is, there is no reasonable basis for doubting the decision. It depends upon three types of testimony. Oral testimony, written testimony, and exhibits such as a gun, a bullet, a notebook. Uh, using the legal method of determining what happened, you could pretty well prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you were in class this morning. Your friend saw you. You have your notes. The prof professor remembers you. Bill? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and that is, that would be how you'd have to, me personally, how you'd have to prove, you know, that, that, that cross existed. There's so much archaeological evidence that's embarrassing. There's so many eyewitnesses around it's embarrassing. And so many writings around it's embarrassing. You know, I remember speaking to, this is still on topic, so don't worry. I'm not going to meander too long. I remember speaking to a, probably an agnostic about two, three years ago. And they were saying, you know, there's not enough real evidence for, you know, the, the Bible and that stuff like that. And I said to him, I said, do you believe, you know, historically speaking, uh, you know, Caesar's wars or, or the, 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 the Germanic wars of Caesar, you know, and he says, yeah, well, yeah, because that's kind of history. And I pointed out to him then, I said, well, there's about 27,000 fragments, copies, or ancient, you know, papyrus, etc., of the Bible, yet there's only one fragment of the Germanic Wars by, by, by Caesar. And, and I like, just made him think. And again, it's down to, like I said, accounts. That that's written down on paper. It actually happened in history, again, archaeological, eyewitness testimony, and it was written down about the, the, these wars in Germany. And people believe it. And I said, you know, the same logic should be applied for the Bible, because, like I said, there's 27 or 1,000 fragments, portions, etc., for the Bible. So I think, you know, that's a valid point that, it's, that, that he's making. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Brother Joe? Yeah, I, got, I forgot to unmute myself that time. <clears throat> yeah, what Bill's talking about is uh, empirical evidence and uh, eyewitness account uh, written down in any court of law. And if I'm not mistaken about this, I'm searching in my memory here, but empirical evidence is the, the most uh, convincing uh, to a, a, a court. And that's because there's eyewitness testimony. And uh, the Bible is eyewitness testimony and so it may be uh, historical but it's historical and empirical uh, a lot of uh, history that we 
assume as correct and accept as fact is not empirical. It's it's uh, written by historians who've heard it from other people, who've heard it from other people, and they've researched other documents in order to write down correct history. And so it's, it doesn't pass the test of empirical uh, that is the highest form, which is eyewitness testimony. And, and the Bible is largely eyewitness testimony recorded uh, firsthand and, uh, and then submitted to, uh, to us. And so uh, rather than questioning the information, we have to question uh, the authenticity of the eyewitness testimony. And uh, later on in the book, that's done quite convincingly. Back to you, Keith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm going to um, put forth my own theory about um, why so many people um, want to dismiss uh, the, the, the veracity of the Bible, uh, the, the historicity, and the all the things that we're going to be discussing in this study uh, that uh, we're putting forth as, as evidence that Christianity is true uh, and that uh, the Bible is uh, reliable and correct and accurate. Um, many people are really quick to dismiss it and they they want to uh, it to be judged on a different standard then they would judge everything else. Uh, uh, as, as, as we said, people accept uh, that uh, certain things are, are, are true uh, without challenging them, uh, without demanding scientific evidence to support it. They know that some things can't be proven scientifically, and yet they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, because it can't be proven scientifically, it should be just a, you know, considered untrue. Uh, but that seems to be the default position of some people. Well, why is that? Why do they have that kind of an attitude? I know I'm not the first person to, to uh, uh, conclude this, and I don't, I don't want to apply this to, to, to everybody. But I think there are some people that uh, they, they're just adamant about rejecting the Bible and Christianity because the, the anything except the existence of God is acceptable. But the existence of God and, and, and the, the, the biblical account of creation and the, the need for Jesus, uh, these things are absolutely unacceptable to, to some people. And uh, they, why, why is that? And I think it's because some people feel that they don't want to be under any kind of um, authority. And if, and if there is a creator, then they realize that uh, the one that created us is greater than us, and perhaps he has, uh, you know, certain uh, things that he would either require of us or um, expect of us, and certain maybe even a certain standard uh, of, of the way he'd like us to live our lives. And people, these people, do not want to be under that kind of. Uh, they think that they're, they're, they would not be free. It, that be, becoming a Christian takes away their freedom somehow to maybe live their lives the way that they want. And we know that that uh, uh, you can become a Christian and, and still live your life however you want. I mean, if you want to continue taking drugs and drinking alcohol, being promiscuous, lying, cheating, stealing, you're free to do all those things and you can still be a Christian. It's just it means... That doesn't mean that you're going to have a good life. If you're if you're living a horrible life, you're going to get con bad consequences out of your life. So, there is a fallacy that people think that in order to become a Christian, you have to follow some set of religious rules now that are imposed on you, taking away your freedom. But the truth is, uh, even we uh, Christians, we're still free to sin or do whatever we want to do. It's just that we realize it's foolishness. It's not it's not beneficial. Uh, the Bible says, I think Apostle Paul says, all things are um, uh, um, lawful, but not all things are expedient. All, all things, and Bill, how's it, how's it go? I think okay, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient or beneficial, if you want to say that. Yeah, in other words, as, as a Christian, 
uh, you know, I could I could live any kind of life I want, but it but you know, I'm free to do those things, but but it's not beneficial. It's not good for me. It's not good for the people around me. So that this is a fallacy that that many people have about Christianity. Uh, so it doesn't take away your freedom. You're still free to to live a horrible life and be a sinner and do whatever you want. In fact, even if we uh, we Christians uh, try not to live these horrible lives, we 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 still can't succeed perfectly at living the right kind of life as God would have us live. Uh, we, we none of us can succeed perfectly at that anyway. But it's my th theory that some of these people think that I, it's uh, anything but God. There can't be a God. Uh, I would accept uh, aliens. Uh, and, and let's say, uh, uh, what do they call it? Fertilizing or uh, planting the genetic seeds on this planet. Maybe aliens caused us to come into existence, but not not God. Anything's possible. They'll accept any possible theory, even Darwinian evolution, as flawed and as absurd as it is. If you really study it objectively, they're willing to accept anything that is so convoluted and ridiculous because it's not God. So that's why people are making these demands to us for us to prove uh, our faith is. Uh, justified by evidence when they don't have these same, they're not imposing these same requirements for anything else uh, in life to be true. Before I continue your thoughts on that, uh, uh, Bill. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. And a similar scenario you know, comes to mind, and that's about, you know, the, the creation of the world. You know, if you said to someone, you know, is it possible that, that a creator uh, of the world and universe could create everything in a split second. You know, they're saying, yeah, that's feasible, they could do that. And, and then you say, well, what about over millions and billions of years, you know, by, you know, feastic evolution? Yeah, that could happen. But the moment you say seven days, straight away, there's sudden spiritual occurs and they're, they're vexated. They hate the fact that, that God can create the world in literally six days but they'd accept in a split second or millions and billions of years. And again, I think a lot of it, to be honest, especially, you know, in Western civilization, is the fault of religionity, not Christianity, not the real Christ, but, but the Christ of religion and, and all, all the, the, the crawl and callous things that, that that is entailed. So I think you, you're right that that is a real big element. Well, straight away, you know, you mentioned Christ, you mentioned Jesus, the picture people get is, you know, oh, got to obey this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that. He hates people, wants to send them all to hell. What do I serve a God? You know what I mean? And, and, and all those connotations. That's the big problem, I think. All right, thank you. Brother Joe, your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I had a sociology professor uh, that quite a nutty guy, walked around with an arrow all the time, slapping it on people's desks, but he made a good point. He, he said that uh, if uh, Christianity would do away with its uh, sexual restrictions, that he imagined it would spread across the world like wildfire, and there wouldn't be anybody that wouldn't be a Christian overnight. And, uh, of course, the Pope's trying to do that right now, so we'll see how, how well that uh, thought plays out. But <clears throat> it's like this Mandela effect. It's a trick of the mind, you know, like you say, uh, you know, when you mention God, then uh, all of a sudden uh, it becomes impossible, and uh, it doesn't, uh, it, does, it can't be, you know, and they don't realize it, but the reason they're saying that is because they don't want to submit themselves to, to a higher power or to a creator that, uh, that, that uh, lights our path and guides our way and might restrict their lifestyles and what, the darkness that they find so pleasurable and and without realizing that that's the reason they fall back on the uh, the very scientific method of uh, determining God's veracity by saying oh it can't be true <laughs> end of sentence and now let's start finding out some ways that it can not be true. So, you know, they reach their conclusion and then start searching for evidence, and they don't realize that that's the order of events that's guiding both them and the ones who teach of that. And uh, 
I just want to point out one thing. I looked up while uh, you were talking. Uh, I wanted to make sure I was correct on empirical evidence. But I love the Bible because uh, empirical evidence being the highest form of evidence, it's relying on experience and observation alone without due regard for systems and theories capable of being verified by observation. That's that's got the Bible written all over it more than any textbook that's ever been published. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I, I will continue reading. Um, it says, the scientific method can be used only to prove repeatable things. It isn't adequate for proving or disproving many questions about a person or event in history. The scientific method isn't appropriate for answering such questions as, did George Washington live? Was Martin Luther King a civil rights leader? Who was Jesus of Nazareth? Was Robert Kennedy a Attorney General of the USA? Was Jesus Christ raised from the dead? These are out of the realm of scientific proof, and we need to put them in the realm of legal proof. In other words, the scientific method, which is based on observation, the gathering of data, hypothesizing, deduction, and experimental verification to find and explain empirical regularities in nature, doesn't have the final answers to such questions as, can you prove the resurrection? Or can you prove that Jesus is the Son of God? When men and women rely upon the legal historical method, they need to check out the reliability of the testimonies. All right, let me let me switch the order here and have Brother Joe go first on this one. Well, that's a that's a, a brilliant point, uh, and it, you can you can look back on the character of the historical figures that that uh, recorded the Bible. Uh, now we know it's God breathed, and uh, men were moved at, uh, to uh, to write uh, as God directed. But if you take into account what you just spoke to a, a non-believer, uh, the, the testimony and eyewitness account of people like Paul, uh, to, uh, Saul of Tarsus, uh, and uh, uh, many of the people in the Bible, the Old Testament uh, prophets who are so highly regarded historically uh, accounted for in the, in the uh, country of Israel, uh, we have some really good uh, empirical testimony in the Bible that you won't find very many places because historians write history uh, and they're getting all of their accounts from somebody else uh, usually uh, there are exceptions uh, like my my guy up here uh, Josephus who, who uh, uh, did talk to first-hand witnesses a lot for his uh, his uh, history and the antiquity of the Jews as directed by the Roman government but uh, that's secondhand still the Bible's first-hand accounts for the most part by reputable historical figures uh, pretty powerful really if you if you think about it all right that's all true brother brother Bill I don't think I really add much to what's just been said other than on the grain, the current evidence is, is the way you can, and the Bible is the biggest source of that. You know, the, the amount of eyewitnesses, the amount of people over the years, you know, from Moses penning the first five books to all the way to, you know, John's Revelation. These are real historical people with there's archaeological evidence. There's obviously, as you say, empirical evidence of writings, first hand accounts, witnesses, and stuff like that. And to I don't think there's a book on earth that has got so much evidence. I really don't. Yeah, and uh, I think that uh, the viewing audience at this point, uh, if they're skeptic, uh, they might at this point say, "Well, so you're uh, you're just dismissing science now, dismissing dismissing the scientific method." 
Well, no, if you stick with us throughout this whole series, you're going to find that uh, we are going to argue and prove that the Bible is actually scientifically correct in every way. Uh, so we, we are not uh, dismissing science and, and the need for us understanding science and related to the Bible. We're just saying some things that are of great significance and importance in life uh, some of the things like the examples that we've already listed in this, uh, the, the, these things cannot be repeated in a laboratory and observed, or, and, and you have to rely on something else to conclude is it true or not. And, and the, that's where you get these other methods, uh, such as uh, you know, the, the legal method um, and the use of witnesses and testimonies. Okay, let me continue on. It says, one thing that has especially appealed to me is that the Christian faith is not a blind, ignorant belief, but rather an intelligent faith. Every time in the Bible when a person is called upon to exercise faith, it's an intelligent faith. Jesus said in John 8, quote, you shall know the truth, unquote. Not ignore it. Christ was asked, quote, what is the greatest commandment of all?" Unquote. He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind. Unquote. The problem with most people is that they seem to stop with their hearts. The facts about Christ never get to their minds. We've been given a mind innovated by the Holy Spirit to know God, as well as a heart to love Him and a will to choose him. We need to function in all three areas to have a maximum relationship with God and to glorify him. I don't know about the reader, but my heart can't rejoice in what my mind has rejected. My heart and mind were created to work in harmony together. Never has an individual been called upon to commit intellectual suicide in trusting Christ as Savior and Lord. In the next four chapters, we will take a look at the evidence for the reliability of the written documents and for the credibility of the oral testimony and eyewitness accounts of Jesus. Um, uh, Brother Joe? Oh, I'm, I'm catching this disease called unmuting disease. I start talking and don't realize I'm muted. Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was moved by still the types of evidence again. You know, uh, just trying to remember there's a bunch of different types of evidence and uh, uh, statistical, testimonial, anecdotal. Uh, there's a bunch of them. But to the top of the, the cream, the cream of the milk comes at the top, and that's always eyewitness testimony. And again, I'm going back to what I looked up earlier, and uh, it empirical or eyewitness testimony dismisses systems and theories that the, all the other evidence types use primarily. In other words, if if someone if a forensic team is investigating a shooting and they find a bullet that's lodged in a wall, they have to backtrack. Okay, sign, uh, mathematically speaking, angles, we're looking this way, it must have come from there. Uh, the evidence points to the fact that at this angle, the evidence must have come from the third story window. And so you're getting all these uh, uh, different ways of figuring things out. But the highest form of testimony is a reputable eyewitness that says, yeah, I saw a guy in that third story window right there shoot him. That, that beats everything. That beats all the other types of evidence in a court of law. And that's what the Bible is. And uh, for the most part, now there's also historicity and there's uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, things in the Bible that are testable and provable that uh, Josh McDowell will get into later in this book. But uh, again, uh, eyewitness accounts very powerful by reputable witnesses. All right, thank you, uh, Brother Bill. Yeah, I'll say, 
get back to the point, you know, where he's talking about, uh, you know, when they believe in these things, you know, within Christian, you know, they're quite easily prepared to believe with a heart, but not with a mind. That makes sense and what he was saying. But that is the whole root meaning of belief and faith anyway. You know, and, and you know, when, when you become a Christian, you don't automatically dispose of your, your brain capacity. You know, in actual fact, it's the opposite. The Apostle Paul encouraged the people, you know, the Bereans, you know, and, and they really did the study of these, see that these things were true and so. And, you know, again, belief and faith, you know, is, you know, is, is intellectual. It's intellectual faith. It's to be persuaded that something is true. So, yeah, you know, that, 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 that has to be a very important element of, of believing in Christ, you know, because point is just that it wouldn't be it wouldn't be belief, would it, or or, or 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 faith, or trust, or confidence, or intellectual faith, if you just accepted, you know, some kind of fuzzy, warm Jesus that might be real, might not be real, just in the happens chance you might get to heaven. That's not faith, and that's not belief. So we have to we have to use our intellect. And again, there's so much empirical evidence out there. You know, we, we are really blessed, overly blessed even, to the point that, that we've got everything at a fingertip now, you know, with the interweb and stuff. It's not like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago before the Reformation where you're lucky, if, you know, just a scarce handful of clergymen could, could read the Bible. You know, we live in such a blessed age. We really are. Well, you know, we, we've talked about this uh, this, this uh, subject, um, faith and and proof. Uh, faith, uh, where you, you don't have, um, you didn't see it and you didn't touch it as as uh, as Thomas did. Uh, you just had you believed it anyway. That's faith. We've talked about this in the past. I have a video titled "Faith." the one requirement and I, I go into much greater detail uh, in that uh, I hope you will watch watch that video but um, the for some reason God really values faith matter of fact the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God <laughs> think about that but then the Bible also says that Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So you, it's only faith if you haven't seen it. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. So, but this faith is so pleasing to God. We can't please God without faith. Uh, what is it about faith that God likes so much? I think it's kind of like if I said to you, uh, uh, hey, uh, it's okay to cross the street right now. I know you're, you're blind. You can't see if there's any traffic coming by. But just trust me. Walk 10 steps right now. Trust me. And, and then if, if you did it, I'd be pleased and think, well, you trusted me. You, you, know, you believe what I said and you, you had enough confidence and trust in me that you did it. But, but if, you, if you replied, well, uh, prove it to me. Uh, I, I've got to have more proof before I'm willing to cross the street, uh, and, and then I would, I may, if I take the time, I might be willing to prove it to you, but I'd also be disappointed. Gee, you mean you didn't trust me enough just to do, do what I said just because you trusted me? I have to prove it to you? Well, that's the kind of the scenario that we find in, in the account of, you know, this doubting Thomas, as he's called. Uh, Jesus had risen from the dead. He'd appeared before many witnesses, all the apostles except for Thomas. When Thomas heard about it, he doubted. He didn't believe it. He said, I'm, I can't believe it. I will not believe it. Unless I see him with my own eyes, unless I touch him, I've got to put my fingers in his wounds in order for me to believe it. And so uh, then Jesus, of course, did he materialized into a room that was closed, just appeared in front of Thomas. And Thomas, and he said, come and see me. 
you, you see me, you touch me, put your fingers in my, my wounds. And Thomas did. And he fell on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. And But Jesus said to him, now that you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. And I think it's the kind of example, I, I, it just came to me. I've never been able to express it before. So I, I don't know if anybody's impressed with this example I gave you, but it, it's kind of like, hey, can you just trust me without seeing? It would mean a lot to me. God says, uh, I, I, you can't please me without faith. And that means just trust me. So I remember that was my experience when I got saved in December of 1986. I'm reading the Bible, and I read, hear about the accounts about Jesus and his death for my sins and his resurrection and, and that salvation is a free gift, and he loved me so much he was willing to die for me, and I fell in love with Jesus. And the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And that's what happened to me. When I understood how much he loved me, I, I loved him in return and wanted him to be my savior. Uh, I didn't have any proof. I just read the scriptures and I believed. I trusted him. Uh, over the years, though, studying this book and the other books and many other things and taking many, many, many hours of study and research, uh, I've, I've found out that there's a ton of evidence, a mountain of evidence. And some of this, we're going to scratch the surface in this study, showing you the kind of evidence that supports our faith. And... and for many people, you'll be like Thomas. Uh, you're not going to be quick to just trust Jesus. You're going to need a lot of evidence. I've, I've encountered many people like that in my uh, work as an evangelist. And, and some of these people, when the evidence is presented, they finally believe. Other people are more readily to believe. They're, maybe they're more trusting. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of evidence. We, you don't have to believe just on blind faith without any evidence, we're going to provide evidence. There is evidence uh, that should convince anybody, unless your mind is absolutely closed against the existence of God. Uh, if your mind is open, then the evidence is there. Uh, but if you can believe without the evidence, that's what really makes God happy. Uh, your thoughts on, on that, guys? Uh, Brother Brother Joe first. Yeah, uh what you just said just fired my neurons in a big way. Sometimes you hear something and it just makes you consider deeply uh, the point. And that's what happened just now. You know, it's, it's we when we're uh, we look look at things in a familial way. Uh, your parents say, "Do this, don't do that, don't run in the road," and they expect and, and hope for blind trust, you know, faith in what your parents are saying. And uh, so uh, God puts a great value on faith. Abraham's faith was accounted to him as righteousness. And, and then after we have faith in, in, the, in, the, uh, in God, then we grow in knowledge and, and we start understanding why our faith is there and and uh, it's not blind but you have to take that first step as as a child to not run into the road and then as you grow you discover cars go quite a bit faster than you do and another thing that came to my mind as you were talking is why faith you know why this premium on on faith and if you stop and think about it we're made in in a uh, in God's image. So we have his mankind, saved or unsaved, we have his characteristics. This is the angel watch us with great interest. Well, why is that? Because here we have a fallen creature without God's attributes of power, but with his characteristics. You know, uh, when, he, when it says we're made in his image, it's not so much the five fingers on each hand as the five senses that are so important and the, the, the characteristics of love, anger, rage, all these things, some of them we consider negative, but they're present within God. He put them to be present within ourselves to use towards righteousness. Um, so if you want to understand, consider man. You know, God would, or Christ was God incarnate. 
And you could see the joy he had when he came to see the apostles who were out fishing because they they were so depressed at his at his crucifixion. And they, they kind of said, well, let's just go back to our old lives. He came out there to see them, to uh, have dinner with them. And he was, you could just see the smile on his face. And you could, if you read the scripture, you can feel what he felt because God gave us his emotions. And we can use that as an evidence as we grow in knowledge after we have faith in him to better understand God. And I take great comfort in that. Back to you, Luke. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Brother Bill, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I'm in agreement. Yeah, I'm in agreement. I think when I when I spoke earlier, I didn't probably clarify what I was saying because, it, yeah, faith without faith is impossible to please God. But it isn't. It's not a blind, blind faith that makes sense. It's not a, you know, because if we didn't have the Word of God, you know, because it says faith cometh by here and here and by the Word of God. If we didn't have the Word of God. We could put our faith in the wrong God, the wrong Christ, or some kind of weird entity or spirit. So it's not blind faith to that degree, but it's blind faith to the degree, degree that we've not physically actually seen Christ Jesus or touched him as Thomas did, but we are entrusting, you know, by faith that, that, that God has, has preserved his word and you know what is set forth in the Bible, we we can trust and rely on that, and and, and obviously get saved. So yeah, it's hard for me to try and explain, but it's not blind, blind faith. You know, it's blind to a degree. Like I said, we haven't seen Christ nor touched Him, but it's not blind, blind, as if you know God has completely abandoned us and left us to try and figure out you know our own way to to, to get to Him. If that makes sense. Does that make sense here? Yeah? Um, yeah, I think it all makes sense. Uh, uh, let me uh, let me continue on here. Now we're be ready to begin chapter four, and the title of this chapter is "Are the Biblical Records Reliable?" The New Testament provides the primary historical source for information about Jesus. Because of this, many critics during the 19th and 20th centuries have attacked the reliability of the biblical documents. There seems to be a constant barrage of accusations that have no historical foundation or that uh, have now been outdated by archaeological discoveries and research. While I was lecturing at Arizona State University, a professor who had brought his literature class with him approached me after a free speech uh, lecture outdoors. He said, Mr. McDowell, you are basing all your claims about Christ on a second century docu document that is obsolete. I showed in class today how the New Testament was uh, written so long after Christ that it could not be accurate in what it recorded, unquote. I replied, your opinions or conclusions about the New Testament are 25 years out of date. That professor's opinions about their, or their records concerning Jesus found their source in the conclusions of a German critic, F.C. Bauer. Bauer assumed that most of the New Testament scriptures were not written until late in the second century A.D. He concluded that these writings came basically from myths and or legends that had developed during the lengthy interval between the lifetime of Jesus and the time these accounts were set down in writing. By the 20th century, however, archaeological discoveries had confirmed the accuracy of the New Testament manuscripts. Discoveries of early papyri uh, manuscripts, uh, the John Ryland manuscript, AD 130, the Chester Beatty Papyri, AD 155, and the Bodmer Papyri, 
the second AD 200 bridged the gap between the time of Christ and the existing manuscripts from a later date. Miller Burroughs of Yale says, quote, another result of comparing New Testament Greek with the language of the papyri discoveries is an increase of confidence in the accurate transmission of the text of the New Testament itself, unquote. Such findings as these have increased scholarly confidence in the reliability of the Bible. I guess I'll, I'll stop there. There's a lot more to be said on this, this same thought, the same point he's making here. But uh, let me start with Brother Bill this time and get, get your reaction to that. Well, yeah, it's just, again, it's just shown that, that even within history and, you know, theology, etc., you know, there's always more discoveries. You know, God is not completely left it. You know, not impossible to discover things. And, you know, as you just rightly said, there, there's earlier discoveries. They're finding earlier papyruses and things which endorse and back up, you know, the scriptures entirely. So, yeah, again, it isn't complete blind faith. You know, we, we have been left suffering, and what we've been left can be, can be you know, relied upon, you know, as, as accurate testimony of, of actual historical events. All right, and Brother Joe? Yeah, uh, like Bill said, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's evidences that are continually found. What's neat, and what I've noticed over the years, I'm uh, older than most of the people watching this probably, is that over the years, one thing and then another thing and another thing keeps getting found. You know, you can go from the Dead Sea Scrolls to a Bible that was found opened in the uh, swamps or uh, mosses of England. Uh, just, you know, there's uh, the, the temples, uh, the evidence is under the Temple Mount. Uh, uh, it, the Bible is kind of unique in that if one part of it is verified, it helps uh, uh, the whole Bible be verified. And so, as the years go by during my lifetime, what has happened with evolution? Well, most of the evidences that has been claimed to be found have been found to be frauds <laughs> or inaccurate or improperly just a scads and scads of, of things to disprove what had been formerly asserted and regarding biblical text just the exact opposite and uh, any honest person that knows history would have to conclude that that as the as the Bible continues to be proven more and more the evidence of evolution has been disproved more and more and so uh, kind of a, a lovely spectrum if you're a Christian back to you Luke hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I'm glad you made that uh, comparison. Um, there's the, the as a matter of fact, um, Darwin him, himself, uh, in his writings, he said that in order for his uh, theory to be proven true, uh, that you'd have to eventually find innumerable uh, uh, intermediate uh, fossils. Uh, intermediate is a uh, is a species that's uh, between two other species, and there, and between one species and the next one, according to Darwinian evolution, uh, there would have to be um, unlimited, almost unlimited numbers of slight little changes and alterations, and 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 then you'd have to have each one of these phases, you'd have to have millions of those, so you've got millions times millions, and so. Uh, Darwin, at least he was smart enough to recognize that in, it would be necessary for, in the fossil record for there to be innumerable intermediate species found in the fossil records. And he said if that is not proven true eventually, then uh, his, his theory was, would be, you know, could, should be discarded. 
And of course, all these years have passed and we don't find any of these missing links. And instead of trying to even finding one or two or three that are, that are, are, are not fraudulent, uh, we, we should be finding billions of them, according to Darwin, billions. Why is it hard to find just one or two if there, if there should be billions? So your point is that as time passes, the, the idea of Darwinian type of an evolution, uh, we're, we're seeing that it's, it's just absolutely implausible, in fact impossible. And, uh, and yet with the Bible, the exact opposite thing is happening. The more that they dig through archaeological discoveries and other discoveries, and the, and we're, we're finding that it, everything, instead of refuting the Bible, it confirms everything in the Bible. And some of these things we will be cited as we continue in this book more than a carpenter. But the thing that uh, stood out to me in this last reading I just did is that I had forgotten this particular point that uh, there was a time when it was commonly believed that the uh, uh, the original writings of the New Testament uh, they were uh, late second century is when people finally wrote wrote it down and uh, that's that's clearly been proven to be incorrect. In fact, just off the top of my head, I don't have all the exact dates memorized, but I know around 40 to 45 AD, we find the, 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 the writing of the book of James and the writings of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and then later on, we see all the writings of, of, uh, of uh, John. And there's a dispute where John's last writings, uh, uh, Book of Revelation, if it was written before 70 AD or around 90 to 95 AD, there's two schools of thought on that. But the point is that nobody disputes any longer that all of the New Testament books were completed before the end of the first century. It was not late second century as, as um, they used to think. Um, all right, any, I'll give you another chance to reply to that before we continue reading, uh, Brother Bill. I was and I agree, and I'm going to have to quickly love you and leave you. The, the wife is needing me. So sorry about that, but yeah, I, I concur with everything you just said. I told you earlier that in order to get your wife's permission, you should go wash her feet. Apparently, you didn't do that because now she's demanding you. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not one of them. I should have done that. <laughs> All right. Brother, Brother Joe and I will try to do our best without you. All right, thanks. Oh, and All right. Brother Joe? Well, I, I find myself limping all of a sudden. Uh, no, Bill, don't go. Uh, I, I lost all track of what I was thinking with, with, uh, with Bill's untimely exit. Uh, I'll, I'll have to throw it back to you while I regain my composure. All right, well, let me just kind of recap again. We are talking about the... Uh, idea that they, for a long time, they thought that the New Testament books were penned uh, late second century, uh, and and now it's and nobody argues that any longer. Everybody realizes that it's from roughly forty to A.D. to ninety A.D. in that range. All of them were were written. So, any, any thoughts on that before I continue reading? Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's just another fantastic evidence of the historicity of the Bible. Uh, the the first person accounts are written at the exact right time that the eyewitness accounts would need to have been written. It all flows perfectly. It, it the longer we wait, the more uh, evidences are found, and none are found in the other direction. What a surprise! That's incredible in itself. Uh, they just found Sodom and Gomorrah recently. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it just. The evidence piles up so fast that you can't keep track of it. And the sad point is, is that uh, non-believing uh, people and atheists, especially, uh, don't want to hear about it. They they'll listen for hours on uh, the uh, uh, the primordial soup, but but uh, to investigate the evidence of Scripture is just something their heart doesn't want to do, although they, they say it's just an intellectual exercise and futility to consider it. We know better. Back to you. All right. 
I'll continue reading. Um, Miller Burroughs of Yale says, quote, another result of comparing New Testament Greek with the language of the Papari discoveries is an increase of confidence in the accurate transmission of the text of the New Testament itself, unquote. Such findings as these have increased scholarly confidence in the reliability of the Bible. William Albright, who was the world's foremost of biblical archaeologists, writes, quote, we can already say emphatically that there is no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament uh, after about AD 80, two full generations before the date uh, between 130 and 150 given by the more radical New Testament critics of today, unquote. He, read it, he reiterates this view in an interview for uh, Christianity Today, quote, in my opinion, every book of the New Testament was written by a baptized Jew between the 40s and, uh, and the 80s of the first century AD, very probably sometime between uh, about AD 50 and 75. Sir William Ramsey is regarded as one of the greatest archaeologists ever to have lived. He was a student of the German historical school that taught that the book of Acts was a product of the mid second century AD and not the first century as it purports to be. After reading modern criticism about the book of Acts, he became convinced that it was not a trustworthy account of the facts of that time, AD 50, and therefore was unworthy of consideration by a historian. So in his research on the history of Asia Minor, Ramsey paid little attention to the New Testament. His investigation, however, eventually compelled him to consider the writings of Luke. He observed the meticulous accuracy of the historical details, and gradually his attitude toward the book of Acts began to change. He was forced to conclude that, quote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians, unquote. Because of the accuracy of the most minute detail, Ramsey finally conceded that Acts could not be a second century document, but was rather a mid first century account. Brother Joe? Well, that, that goes directly, directly back to what I was saying before. Uh, with when it comes to, to scripture, uh, no matter what part is uh, evidenced to to be shown to be accurate, it reflects on everything else and within scripture. And so it, it bothers me a great deal that, and this is from having spoken with so many friends who are atheists, that they discount some of the greatest minds. Uh, of our century and, and throughout history, if they uh, are pro proponents of the authenticity and historicity of scripture. And, and a good example is Blaise Pascal. I, I was reading a new scientific magazine some years ago that uh, they were ranking the most uh, incredible thinkers in history. Some of the, the, the great, you know, Galileo always is cream that rises to the top. Well, Blaise Pascal is right up there with Galileo and, and the greatest thinkers, but uh, 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 New Scientific Magazine put him down because he was such a proponent of scripture that it denigrated his otherwise sterling position in scientific history and mathematical history. And so uh, what we find is a lot of uh, otherwise brilliant people dismissing brilliant people based on an illogical assumption that if they uh, stand on the historicity of scripture, that somehow their, their intelligence is denigrated. And that's purely an emotional response. Yeah. Well, the, that, that kind of attitude is just another example of what we said earlier is that uh, Many people, their default viewpoint is that um, anything is possible except the Bible. 
anything is possible except God. They're desperate to not embrace God, particularly the God of the Bible. So they're, 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 they're willing to, to believe any kind of theories, any other alternative ideas, uh, but that the God of the Bible is absolutely unacceptable. So that's kind of the foundation of their, their thoughts. That's the prejudice. I'm, I made a, <laughs> I just shared a video today, one of my older videos titled, Are You Prejudiced Against Jesus? And uh, there are many people, they have a prejudice against the existence of God, the, uh, the, the, uh, the truth of the Bible, uh, the, the God of the Bible, Jesus, they're prejudiced against it. Then they, they, they'll accept anything else uh, as an alternative other than that. And that, that leads there, that, that kind of dictates everything else. All their conclusions uh, have to be uh, based upon, well, uh, if, if, it's, if you're telling me something that is biblical, then automatically your reputation as you cited there, you know, the, rep, the reputation is uh, otherwise great thinker. Uh, I see it all today in the political arena. Uh, the, the media is very quick to uh, ask any politician, well, I mean, you certainly accept evolution, don't you? Not, not the biblical account, right? And, and uh, only very few politicians, regardless of what they believe, very few of them have the character and, and strength of character and courage to to say no I, I i believe the biblical account of creation not in darwinian evolution they know if they say that that they'll be mocked and ridiculed uh, so uh, someone who would otherwise be respected maybe because of great other accomplishments politically or scientifically or uh, socially Maybe they've been it would be normally considered great, but if they dare to believe the biblical account of creation that the Bible is true, the God of the Bible is is real, then then uh, they they know they're going to be dismissed dismissed by people. Uh, any other thoughts on that before I continue reading? Yeah, it it's funny uh, how that uh, the atheist world. Well, I don't even want to, yeah, it primarily is the atheist world. They elevate people who otherwise uh, would be mediocre in their fields, like Bill Nye the science guy. <laughs> I mean, uh, he is struggling for relevancy, and, uh, it, it, and they hold degrees in science to be, you know, the holy grail. And this guy, he's... He's undereducated and, and uh, overrated simply because he takes a stand against biblical Christianity. And then on the other hand, uh, and I'm not going to name a particular one because there's so many uh, brilliant Christian scientists who are denigrated and devalued in their fields of expertise simply because they come to the conclusion of the authenticity of Scripture. And it's, it's kind of irritating. Back to you, Lou. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago that Ben Stein, who's a political and, and commentator and also a humorist and a, even an actor, Ben Stein did a documentary uh, uh, making this point that, uh, I forgot the title of it. It's, it's a one word title like uh, Expelled. It, yeah, I think it's Expelled. And the idea that uh, if any scientist uh, held to the uh, uh, did not uh, adhere to this uh, walk in, in 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 step with with this Darwinian viewpoint, uh, if they didn't either uh, believe it or if they uh, even questioned it, uh, then they would be expelled. They'd lose their jobs. They'd lose their careers. Uh, and uh, so that was a very interesting documentary that I recommend everybody watch to see the kind of persecution and ridicule uh, that uh, someone who's an admired, respected scientist doesn't agree with Darwin, Darwinism and, and look how that they are uh, expelled. Okay, I'll continue on. Many of the liberal scholars 
are being forced to consider earlier dates for the New Testament, Dr. John A.T. Robinson's conclusions in his new book, Redating the New Testament, are startlingly radical. His research led to the conviction that the whole of the New Testament was written before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Today, the form critics say that the material was passed by word of mouth until it was written down in the form of the Gospels. Even though the period was much shorter than previously believed, they conclude that the Gospel accounts took on the forms of folk literature, that is, legends, tales, myths, and parables. One of the major criticisms against the form critics' idea of oral tradition uh, development is that the period of oral tradition, as defined by the critics, is not long enough to have allowed the alterations in the tradition that these critics have alleged. Speaking of the brevity of the time element involved in the writing of the New Testament, Simon Kistenmaker, professor of Bible at Dort College, writes, quote, normally the accumulation of folklore among people of primitive culture takes many generations. It is a gradual process spread over centuries of time, but in conformity with the thinking of the form critic, we must conclude that the gospel stories were produced and collected within little more than one generation. In terms of the form critical approach, the formation of the individual gospel units must be understood as a telescoped project with accelerated course of action, unquote. What say you, brother, on that? Oh, that's, that's evidence. That's brilliant evidence. Uh, you know, that the, and, and no surprise to us, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, the, John's Gospels uh, were written just prior and to his death and during his lifespan. And the same with all the Gospels. Uh, gee, no surprise to us, Luke, but uh, I guess these new uh, new uh, discoveries for the scientific community must be gradually and grudgingly accepted, huh? Yeah, uh, I mean, to me, it, it, it is so obvious that because the, the writers of the New Testament books, for the most part, they were all eyewitnesses of, of Jesus and his miracles and his death and resurrection. They were eyewitnesses and they personally penned it or they were there um, um, speaking so that, um, like, um, what's it called when you speak and someone else writes for you? Uh, um, but uh, they, they actually were eyewitnesses that wrote it uh, within their own lifetime. So it's not it's not second, third, center, third, fourth generations apart from the actual eyewitnesses. Uh, what's that word I'm thinking of when you were, oh dictating? Yeah. Some people think that Paul dictated at least one or more of his letters because he was losing his eyesight. All right, uh, he, he dictated it in his own style. You can tell that that Paul's writings are. Uh, uh, from the same person you know if you go back and and look at uh, what they're calling folklore they're trying to include the bible and, and scripture as folklore uh look at the writings on 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 diane or or uh any uh any other true folklore and you'll find that it has been changed and and many people's minds pen different parts and uh it's bits and pieces throughout the centuries uh, and with the gospel, uh, if Paul dictated it, and I don't know that he did, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but it's his writing, it's his style, it's his, it's obviously the same writer for all his books. And uh, anyone with a, a modicum degree of uh, literature or, or a, a logic can, can find that out. It's, it's very much like a fingerprint. Um. Okay, this, this chapter four is a very lengthy chapter. We're not even in, at the midway point. So I, I think that maybe I'll, I'll stop here because I'm kind of fading a little bit. Uh, 
and we'll pick up uh, on this page, uh, you know, next time. Um, so let me ask you if you have any like uh, highlight thoughts about the, the subject today um, and before we conclude. <clears throat> well, my, the, the one thing that the first thing that comes to mind and one thing that stands out is that the, the scientists of today and the Darwinians, the, the people who are followers of Darwin and evolution uh, are using broken science and, and going against their own theories of what is uh, uh, relative, pertinent, and provable. And uh, they're, they're, they're using methods that uh, create doubt in what they're saying and really validate what scripture's saying. And so if they would just step back and really look at things from a scientific perspective, like they preach, and compare scripture with uh, uh, any theory against scripture, they would have to, have to conclude what some of the greatest thinkers of all time have concluded, and that is scripture is historically accurate, more accurate than uh, anything that they are laying hold of to disprove it. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I think it's been a very interesting d discussion. We actually covered a lot of different subject matter, and the, in the end here, we're we're talking about the, uh, uh, the the dating of these New Testament books, and and uh, this chapter four goes into much more detail uh, as we go along, showing us that uh, we can trust these books. Uh, so, I look forward to that. Be, before we, uh, oh, let me ask Brother Ted if he if he's still with us on the phone there. To uh, uh, would you like to make any final comments uh, as far as your thoughts on the study? Are, are you there, Brother? Uh, no, not not particularly. But thank you uh, and all you guys. I'm I'm in a hundred percent agreement, and I concur with uh, what you guys have said. The evidence is on a, on the side of Scripture, and the evidence is always on the side of truth. Thank you. Um, all right, um, Brother Joe, I've, I've never asked you to do this, but uh, if, if you're um, willing and, and feel inspired at all, would, would you mind taking a couple of minutes to tell the, the viewers the, the good news about who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and what is required for salvation? Well, I'm greatly intimidated. I, I don't think I've ever done this. And uh, I don't know that I'm the right person to do it. Uh, you're the professional, and it's, it's such an important uh, aspect. It, it, it's really what all this is about, you know, uh, the historicity of the Bible and the, the uh, what you believe regarding Darwinism is all irrelevant if if you don't know the God of the Bible. Um, I don't, I, I don't have a, a clear clarion call here for, for uh, uh, salvation. I'll, I'll tell you what, what I think. I think that, uh, number one, people need to know that we are a creation. We're not a, a stopwatch that assembled itself. We didn't come from primordial soup. Uh, and if we uh, are a watch that was made by a maker instead of by random chance, then we, with all diligence, need to try to seek God out. And I think God put in us the desire to seek him out. You know, all through history, all men and all cultures have two great things in common, and that's a need for family and a need to find God. And so no matter where you go throughout history, those two things are always present. And that's because God put it in us. And I believe that he calls all men and he gives light to all men. And how we respond to that light determines our path. And so I would say 
that you need to consider the Word of God and at, especially uh, I don't want you to have to wait till this study is done or after you read this book but uh, I can say with all certainty like millions of people all throughout history that the Bible is the Word of God and according to the Bible the Word of God uh, Jesus Christ being creator came to this world as a man uh, the word became flesh people are always saying why doesn't God show himself why doesn't God uh, send us a sign send us a, a book well he did he wrote us the Bible I believe and we're going to prove that but he also came in person in the form of Jesus Christ and if you want to know God then all you need to do is look at Christ because he was God incarnate and he said that mankind has a fallen nature. We're all imperfect. We all have a sin nature. And he gave us a conscience so that we would realize that. Nobody's without that internal knowledge that something's not right with us. Everybody, even the atheists know that mankind has an evil bent. And that's not saying that everything we do is evil. We were made in the image of God and we do have Godly characteristics and uh, godly emotions and, and a lot of thing about a lot of things about us are good, but we have that fallen nature. And and if you want to want proof outside the Bible for mankind's fallen nature, look at history. Millions and billions of people slaughtered, uh, just walk down the streets of Seattle at one o'clock in the morning, and you're taking your life in your hands. That's because mankind has evil within him <clears throat> and whether it's a small amount or a great amount within each person there is that that fallenness to our nature and god says that 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 fallen nature needs to be corrected or paid for that he calls it sin we have a sin nature and if we go through life not acknowledging our sin nature and acknowledging god then we've separated ourselves from him so many people today are walking through life not knowing God and their only uh, joys and hopes are circumstantial and within themselves because they don't know God God says if you want to know me just ask me place your trust and your faith in what I say and and then ask and I will prove myself to you Christ had to die for the sins of mankind and I don't know why but he being the creator and me being the creation I accept by faith that he did have to die for the sins of mankind and he offers us <clears throat> the gift of salvation through faith and that is simple trust and belief that Christ is who he said he was and did what he said he would do and if we just believe what God has told us just like our parents don't run in the road if we'll just believe and in faith take that first step he will prove himself to you I guarantee it it says so in Scripture if you will say I want to know you God and I choose to believe the truth of the gospel then you will be saved that's all there is to it if you're a homosexual a drug addict a gambler a drunkard it makes no difference because we're all flawed in some way even if we just steal cookies that's all that's all all the sinning we do we still need to have that fallen nature made right with a relationship with God and by simply saying in faith I believe what the Bible said I believe Christ was God who came to give his life for the sins of mankind and I want to receive that free gift through faith then you'll be saved it doesn't come without a cost though keep in mind that when you put your faith and trust in God he's gonna change your desires this is not something we have to work at the one thing I want people to know is they do not have to take a bath and clean themselves up before they get into the bathtub by simply placing simple faith is whatever you can muster God will do the rest and and so there is a cost 
you got to know your uh, the things that that are bad for you. God will put into you a, a, a desire not to do those things. So it's not like you get to just go through life. Uh, okay, I had faith in in uh, Christ, and now there's uh, nothing else that uh, I need to do. Well, you don't need to do anything, but keep in mind, He will change your desires, and you will have a relationship with Him. Now, you can easily go through life never having that relationship. Uh, it's it's easy to be blind, you know. It's like the movie The Matrix, you know. Uh, you can live in a society where uh, you just don't acknowledge Him. Well, you're going to go into eternity never acknowledging Him. You have the opportunity to have a communion with your Creator and have that after death for eternity. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be away from God in whatever state that may be. I don't know. Uh, but they will, will not be in communion with God for eternity. He offers us eternal life uh, and communion with him now and then should we place simple faith in what he did. That's the best I can do, Luke. Okay. Well, that's the best you can do. I, I think it was an excellent explanation for everybody to understand that uh, uh, we, we all need Jesus. That, that's the one thing you need to really understand is that uh, there is no other way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So uh, if, if you think you can uh, get into heaven, if you believe there is such a thing as a heaven, the Bible says there is. Bible says that there will be new heavens and new earth. And those of us who live there will live forever. We'll never get sick or die or have tears or pain ever again. Just joy and bliss and happiness forever in the new heavens and new earth. That's what the Bible says. And if you if you believe that's true and you want that, uh, Jesus says he's the only way, the only way to get it. But he offers it to you as a gift. No strings attached. Nothing required on your part because he did it all. He paid for our sins and he gives you life everlasting as a gift if you want it, if you'll just trust him for it. If you believe in him for it, the Bible says that's the only requirement. Um, now, we talked about different types of people. Some people can believe without proof. Uh, and other people, like Thomas, says, well, prove it to me. I'm not going to believe it unless... He appears to me. I touch him. And so what we're going to attempt to do is tell you about some of the evidence that gives us confidence. Our faith is justified. But Jesus realized that uh, people would need proof. And when the Jews demanded proof, they said, give us a sign to prove your claims are true. He said, the sign I will give you is his resurrection. He said, um, I will be crucified and buried, but I'll raise myself bodily, back to life on the third day. This was the sign to prove he is God. He is the Savior. He is the source of life everlasting. And it's the resurrection that gives us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. So thank you, Jesus. Raising yourself from the dead so that we can know that, that uh, it's all true. Put your faith in Jesus now. Receive the gift of everlasting life, the promise of going to heaven from Jesus. Brother Joe, you did an excellent job as usual. And uh, look forward to the, the next study we do on this as we continue through this book, More Than a Carpenter. Uh, Brother Ted, thank you for uh, joining us too. And Brother Bill, um, I, you, I hope you're really nice to your wife. So maybe next time she lets you stay for the whole broadcast. <laughs> Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.